This year marks the 40th anniversary of Iran's 1979 Islamic Revolution. The revolution changed the face of the modern Middle East, and its repercussions still echo today. Now, what happened in 1979 culminated with the departure of Iran Shah, Mohammad Reza Pahlavi. The Shah left Iran on January 16, 1979. His departure didn't come as a shock to Iranians, but it did surprise the West, particularly America and the British. The reason for that is the British had started to withdraw from the Middle East. They used to be the colonial power of the Middle East, but they had begun to pull back. And America was looking for a strong ally in the Middle East to basically be the sheriff of the region, to make sure that uh, its security interests were kept. The Shah fit that mold. The Shah had spent billions upon billions of dollars to buy American weaponry over the years that he was in power. He was also one of the first people in the Middle East to recognize Israel. That fit with America's uh, desires and America's outlook on the region, especially during a time when Arab countries uh, fought several wars against Israel. After the Shah left on January 16, 1979, confusion reigned on the streets of Tehran. There were revolutionaries, there were still loyalists who were uh, loyal to the Shah, who were uh, in open clashes with these protesters. And for days afterwards, it really wasn't clear if the monarchy was gonna be able to hold on. On February 1st, 1979, Ayatollah Rula Khomeini came back to Tehran. Millions of people greeted him in the streets. Now, in the, in the run up to him coming back, he and his allies had started to make contacts with the revolutionaries who were on the streets, uh, pro democracy activists, and others. And when he came in, uh, analysts say that he presented sort of a tabla rasa, that he was sort of a blank slate on which people projected their own ideas of how they hoped Tehran and the rest of the country would turn out if there was a revolution. Now, unbeknownst to them, the Ayatollah, for years prior, had written a lot of uh, religious texts that proclaimed that he wanted to have strict Islamic rule, that he wanted to really crack down and really have, have an authoritarian sort of grip on power. But at the time when he came in, people were kind of hoping that he would be uh, more of a figurehead, that he wouldn't actually reach out, that there would be some sort of democracy movement that would take over. Now, the days after his arrival, there were open clashes in the streets between supporters of Khomeini, democracy activists, Marxists, and the royalist military. Now, this culminated with an attack on uh, an air base that was outside of Tehran. It was very bloody. But on February 11th, 1979, that's the day that the army came out and said that they were going to return to the barracks and they were going to listen to the will of the people. And at that point, that was when Iran's Islamic Revolution took hold. Now today in Iran, what you have is what they describe as an Islamic Republic. You have at the top the supreme leader. That's a Shiite cleric who has final say over all state matters. Elsewhere, you have an elected president, you have an elected parliament, and other elected local leaders as well. They say that allows them to have democracy while still honoring their Shia heritage. Others criticize it because they say that there can be no true democracy if there's an, elect if there's an unelected leader at the top who has final say over all state matters. That's one of the major criticisms that you hear from people outside of Iran when they criticize the government there. Now, even outside of Iran, the 1979 Islamic Revolution had a lot of effect on what happened across the greater Middle East. One place in particular was Saudi Arabia. After the Shah's departure, America was casting around trying to find someone it could see as its main security ally in the region. It found that security ally in Saudi Arabia. That, that uh, partnership has lasted for four decades. Now, there has been times that those, that partnership was severely tested. One time was the September 11th, 2001 terror attacks where a lot of the, the people who were on board those jetliners were Saudis. And more recently, you've seen America really start to push back against Saudi Arabia over the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, a uh, Washington Post uh, opinion page uh, contributor who was killed inside of the Saudi consulate in Istanbul. And you've also seen a lot of pushback over Saudi Arabia's uh, years-long war in Yemen. Elsewhere in the region, you saw uh, Iran's government reach out and fully support the Palestinian uh, Liberation Organization. One of the first moves after the revolution, or even during the revolution, was people took over the Israeli trade office and gave that office to the PLO. The, P uh, the Palestinians still have that office today in Tehran. Yasser Arafat was the first foreign leader who came to visit uh, Tehran and, and congratulate the Ayatollah on the Islamic Revolution. 
And another thing that people don't really see is that this was the first time that you had sort of a revolutionary Islam wet itself into a modern government in the Middle East. And militants across the region saw that as an opportunity and a sign that maybe they also could take over their own governments as well. Now, 40 years later, as Iran marks the Islamic Revolution's uh, anniversary, one of the most important things that it has to face is its relationship with America. That may not be surprising, because in 1979, students stormed the U.S. Embassy in uh, Tehran and took hostages that they held for 444 days. And that incident still colors the way that America views Iran and Iran views America. Now, under President Barack Obama, Iran reached a nuclear deal with world powers that saw it uh, limit its enrichment of uranium in exchange for the lifting of economic sanctions. Under the administration of President Donald Trump, however, America has pulled out of the deal, which is now in, in jeopardy. Today, Iran is trying to determine what, whether to stay in the deal or whether it'll start resuming the enrichment of uranium. Officials recently have suggested that they could begin that within days if they chose to. I'm John Gambrell for the Associated Press in Dubai and the United Arab Emirates.